Hey, Coach, morning. Good morning, you dynamic duo. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you should have caught us at 6.15. I hope the boss is listening so you can get a raise. Yeah, that'd be awesome. We, we need that, uh, Coach. Now, you will be here for the Heart of Hope Ministries annual banquet. That is Thursday night at the Shreveport I Convention Center. Will. How did you get involved with those folks? And and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, tell us a bit about that. Two of the most benevolent people I've met on earth live in Shreveport, Louisiana, both doctors. Bernadette and Carter Boyd, and they were the ones that got me involved, and they told me about it, and it hit my heart, um, n- not only what they were trying to do, but for the young ladies that I'm going to visit at, at, the, at their home for teenage girls who are having an unplanned pregnancy, and they're staying at the Heart of Hope as their home now, trying to teach life skills and attend a parenting classes while preparing to be young moms. In other words, they've made a decision not to abort their babies. Now, this is very important to me. And the reason it's very important to me is because two days before I was born in Minot, North Dakota, my mother's husband, which is my biological father, which I've never called him that, uh, left her. She lived on a farm. Uh, with her, She moved off the farm into a one-room apartment with no money, uh, eighth-grade education, had to go on welfare, become a maid. But the woman, the mom, with no father in the home, changed my whole life just by watching her and never seeing her complain in the love. And I thought, you know what? I could have easily been one of those people that could have been aborted. She had nothing. It was embarrassing. It was degrading to her to clean people's homes and to babysit for 50 cents an hour. So I want to reach out to these women and compliment them for for not killing a child because that's what it is. And then I'm going to see them early on on Thursday. And then Thursday night, there's the annual Heart of Hope Banquet at the Shreveport Convention Center. I think there's a VIP reception at 5, and the banquet starts at 6.30. And what I want to talk about at the banquet is we're all in this together. You know, the best potential, and this isn't isn't a brain surgeon or a, a prophet giving you this, But in anything we do in life, whether it's just living on the earth or being a a leader, a coach, a teacher, a parent, the best potential of me is we. And we have to reach out to each other. So I'm looking forward to it. And anyone that needs any information, by the way, since I'm rattling off so fast, (laughs) there is a Heart of Hope number that you could call if you're interested in attending. And I will give that to you. It's 318 92 663 and gotcha. for those that didn't get it 318-925-4663 we've got all the information on our website too keelnews.com coach will you tell a story i don't think robert's heard um about the day your high school coach taught you that lesson i do you remember what i'm referring to <clears throat> the, are you talking about uh, being on time Oh, 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 he was the former high school coach. He was right. now the principal. Yeah, tell that story because yeah. it, it was an they amazing life lesson. It, 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 it taught me really something. In fact, it, it's, it's been a, a beacon light to my whole life. Um, I went to a little tiny Catholic school, 100 in the whole high school. We played the largest schools in the state. Some high schools had 3,000, and we played them, only 100 people. And you were a superstar. Well... Yeah, but listen. You're not going to say that, but he was. No, there's there's more people in uh, in your building today than lives in North Dakota. So being a, <laughs> being a superstar, it has an asterisk to it. But anyway, here I was, and I'm not trying to be the Donald Trump of Louisiana, be narcissistic, but here I was, the leading scorer in the history of high school basketball in North Dakota. I was the class president. I broke the record in uh, track and field. I was the highest scorer in the football team. I was, oh, I thought, I thought I was Mr. It, kind of. We had to turn our eligibility slips in at 1 o'clock every Monday. I had no problems with that, being eligible, but I wandered down, threw it on the desk, and as I'm leaving, Dale, come on back. And he picked up my eligibility slip and held it up in front of him. And he had horn rimmed glasses on. I can still see it. And he said, what is this? And I thought to myself, that's a funny question. I said, it's my eligibility slip. He said, what time was this eligibility slip due here? I said, 1 o'clock. He said, can you see that clock on the wall over here? I said, yes. What time does it say on the clock? He says, 1.15. That's good. 
we, we have now come to the conclusion that you knew this was your eligibility slip, you knew it was due at 1 o'clock, and you can read time it was 1.15. He said, as a result, you're not going on the trip. And he ripped my eligibility slip into little pieces and threw in the garbage to get back upstairs. So I'm going back upstairs. Mm. I thought, there is no way, none, zero, he's going to leave me. I'm scoring half the points on the team. Right. There's no way he can leave me. I stood in the driveway crying as they drove off to play two of the largest schools in the state. And from that instant on, I thought, never will I. In fact, I'm almost paranoid about it. If you're going to have lunch with me at 1.30, I'm always there, at least 15 to 20 minutes early. And I think what it teaches us not to be slothful, but be prompt. And I also learned from the mothers that I'm going to speak to, I'm going to tell them a story about her. There's a, she represented, one of my favorite poets is Edgar Guest. And he said, I'd rather see a lesson than to hear one any day. I'd rather you walk with me than to merely show the way. The eyes of better teacher and more willing than the ear. And the counsel you are giving Aaron and Robert may be very fine and true, but I'd rather get my examples by observing what you do. Let me give you a paramount example. Mm-hmm. Two times in the middle of winter, and I'm talking about 35 below zero in Minot, North Dakota, there's a little child, 10 child. She'd come back from the grocery store with two brown paper sacks, and I could see her still crossing it on. She'd have a cross out on the slip, you know, peas, bread, beans, milk, sell the meat in there. And two times after taking everything out of the sacks, I saw her go get her winter coat. She didn't say anything. She said, I'll be right back. Said, Where are you going, Mama? She came over, and she had a quarter in hand. Oh, the lady at the Red All gave me a quarter too much. Several months later, I saw her do the same thing. And she said, oh, the lady at the Piggly Wiggly gave me 40 cents too much. Mm. Now, to, to us, that was a fortune. She didn't, you know, practice what you preach. No, no. She didn't preach anything. Mm. I'd rather see a lesson than to hear one any day. So these ladies that are in this terrible condition, uh, they could use my mother as a beacon light because she gave me all the principle. Any, any good I have in me came from that woman. Coach, let's talk basketball a second. In your mind, what's the state of college basketball right now? And when when I think about it, I, the first thing I think about is the biggest change, other than the three-point shot, is one and done. What do you think yeah. is the current state of college basketball? I don't like it at all, and I've, I'm so grateful to basketball. It taught me everything. Uh, gave me a good first self-image of myself. I had an inferiority complex. It taught me discipline. It taught me taught me teamwork. It got me an education I could have never afforded to go to college. My mother had an eighth grade education. Both of my sisters were just high school graduates because they had to go to work, make money. So I really love sports and basketball. But here's what I despise about it. Number one, the NCAA for years, they're getting better, has practiced. uh, They legislate against human dignity and practice monumental hypocrisy. That's, That's a... One of the great sports writers of all time, Frank DeFord of Sports Illustrated, said they're the largest legal cartel in the world. Well, eliminate them. They are getting better. It's like saying they've come a million miles, but they've got a light year to go. Number two, I, the, the one and done has got to be the stupidest thing ever. There's no, no relationship you. you can have with anybody. It's stupid. Um, one and done. So you know what they can do? They can come in the first semester knowing they're going to go pro, Never go to class the second semester. All they do is play basketball. That's wrong. It's also wrong for the fans. You don't get accustomed. You you don't know who they are. They're in and out and back and forth. If I was coaching right now, I would not take a one-and-done person. John Calipari is a masterful guy to be able to do it. I don't know how he handles it. So that should be eliminated. They should be able to go out of high school and go. If they come, it should be the same rule with football and baseball. You have to stay here for three years before you can go out. Dale, let me ask you this. Johnny Jones, my classmate, played for you. Yep. Uh, is, is, is he done? Let me give you an example of that. There's an awful lot of pressure and talk, and it's terrible, but let's examine some facts. And this is a nepotism. Yes, do I love him? Obviously I love him. He's one of my players. Uh, he's one part of my family. When I recruited these kids, I told all their parents, I can tell you a bunch of things, but the most important thing I can tell you, I'm recruiting a human being first and a basketball player second. 
I'll promise you, if he'll follow the rules, I know what can be done. He will leave with a degree. 85% of the guys that stayed here for four years left here with a degree in their hand. Johnny Jones, one of the nicest people you ever meet. So, is this a horrendous, terrible year? Yes. I can't stand to go. I'm nervous and frustrated at the games, and it's depressing. However, patience. John Wooden had never been to a Final Four until his 14th year at UCLA. One of the greatest football coaches of all time was Tom Landry, the Dallas Cowboys. First year, he never won a game. He never had a winning season his first six years, but the organization was patient. With that in mind, if he is released, they are releasing the man that after five years, no matter if he wins another game, is the fourth winningest coach. He's won more games than any coach in the history of LSU but three men. So... Mm. I know that sounds like, well, you're cheering. Sure, I'm cheering him on. Is Has the team been terrible at times? They've been terrible at times. But they are young, they are learning, and they're learning the hard way. Sometimes you got to get knocked down before you can really really wake up. And This has been a knockdown, drag-out season. And Dale nobody, Brown, uh, I don't know anyone that enjoys it. 